Okay, so without any further ado, let's go into naive base classifier. Okay, and uh, let me put it on this. So, <clears throat> so again, as a naive, uh, as the name suggests, this is a, a classifier built on something called as base theorem. Okay, B B A Y E S base. Uh, it's actually a person's name. Uh, called base and he came up with uh, uh, a rule called base rule back in i think 1700s okay not even 1900s or 2000s but 1700s uh, it's a it's a rule about probabilities and um, uh, specifically about prior probability and the posterior probability and uh, naive base classifier is essentially the formulation of a classification problem in the um, uh, in the aspect of uh, this base rule, okay, like in the k-means, we we looked at the formulation of uh, clustering problem as an optimization function, right? Similarly, you can formulate the classification problem as a probability rule, and you can use base rule to solve that problem. And uh, such a approach is called uh, naive base classifier. Okay. Uh, so, as I mentioned, it relies on base rule, which is essentially uh, a probability equation connecting prior probability and posterior probability. So, before we understand the classifier, obviously we have to understand these basic things called uh, prior probability and the posterior probability. Okay. And before that, we need to know what probability is. And I assume every one of us know what probability is. So let's call, uh, let's talk about prior probability. Okay. So uh, as described on this particular slide, let's say um, one of your friend is talking uh, to a person in a train journey, right? Uh, and he's telling you about that conversation. And uh, if somebody else asks you, what is the, pro what do you think, uh, or whom do you think your friend is talking to, a man or a woman? Okay. So you have to guess who that person is. And what would you guess? It's a 50 50 uh, chance, right? So your prior probability, that means without knowing any information about the conversation or about the, uh, specifics of that particular incident, you have some prior probability associated with a man and prior probability associated with a woman. Okay, so there's a 0.5 probability that your friend is talking to a woman, and there's a 0.5 probability that your friend is talking to a man. Right? However, if you have extra knowledge that, uh, let's say, uh, like a railway person tells you that, okay, 70% of uh, passengers on this particular train are women and 30% of them are men. Okay, you got that information somehow. Then what is your uh, belief or probability that your friend is talking to a man and friend is talking to a woman? It suddenly changes, right? Now, your probability that uh, that person is a man will be 0.3 and that person is a woman is 0.7, right? Because of the knowledge that you got, gained. So your pro prior probability will now be 0.3 and 0.7, okay? So just to recap, prior probability is something that you just know about a uh, certain thing without any specific information. Okay, now this is a probability that you start with and then during the conversation, let's say uh, your friend tells you that that person has long hair. Okay, now suddenly your probabilities change, right? Because since the person has long hair, there's higher likelihood that that person is a female than a male, right? And uh, uh, so that's called kind of a posterior probability after effect, okay? How things will change after you know certain information. And the base rule is kind of connecting these two 
prior probability and the posterior probability. Okay. So this example is just to make you understand what is the notion of a prior probability. Okay. I and I hope uh, that's kind of gotten into your head. Now, with that, <clears throat> so let's look at uh, a classification problem and we'll see how it can be formulated as a probability uh, in terms of probability. Okay. So just to make our um, discussion much more easier, let's take this example. You have a bunch of data points. Some are colored in red and some are colored in green. Okay. And uh, our problem is that given as the new data points are coming into your system, you have to classify them to be a green or red. Okay. Depending on whatever you want to do. As the data points are coming in, you want to classify them to be green or red. Okay. Without telling you any information about the new data point, that means I won't tell you whether it's falling in this area or this area or this area or this area without telling any information. Can you come up with uh, the probability that the point is green and the probability that it is red? Can you think of some idea of coming up with that probability? All I gave you is this data set showed you where the green points are, where the red points are, how many of them are there and so on. I gave you this training data and uh, with that training data, can I come up with some probability which tells you what is the likelihood that the new point is green and the likelihood that it's a uh, red. I look at this data and I kind of make a rough observation that uh, uh, about two thirds of my data is green and one third of my data is red, right? So that means I have some prior bias towards uh, red, uh, towards the green values, right? It's likely that uh, it can be, uh, the chance of the new data point being green is more than the chance of that being uh, red, right? That's the prior probability. I simply count how many greens are there, how many reds are there and I assume that new data also kind of follows the same distribution and therefore I compute my prior probability. Okay. So that's the notion of the prior probability. Without any information about the data point, that is the probability that you expect uh, the new data point to follow. Okay. Now, let's say the <coughs> Okay, this is just that um, uh, description. Prior probability of green is essentially the number of green objects divided by the total number of objects, obviously. And the prior probability of red is similarly number of red divided by the total number. And in this particular example, it can be let's say two third, 40 by 60 and 20 by 60. Okay. Now, <coughs> Okay. Um, okay. So now a new data point comes into your system. Okay. And let's say that is our, this white circle, the small white circle, since it's color is not decided yet. It's in white color. Now you have to decide, uh, given its location, and other information that you may want to uh, have from that point. Given that all that information, now you have to make a decision whether it's going to be a red or a green. Okay. And one uh, possible way of doing that is I draw a small neighborhood around that particular point. Okay. Let's say some circle with some radius. Now I count Okay, with this circle, now can you tell me whether it is likely to be a green or red? Okay, I got a new data point in my system. I put a small neighborhood around it, thinking that that neighborhood drives uh, my decision process. 
Now, what should this color be? Okay, it's it's obviously red, and that is because there are more number of red points in the neighborhood than the green point, and therefore we expect that uh, new point to be red color. Okay, how do we how do we uh, formalize this intuition? Which is essentially we are talking about the likelihood. What is the likelihood that this becomes a red point, and what is the likelihood that it becomes a green point? and in this case likelihood is simply defined as the number of red points divided by the total number of points in that neighborhood and the number of green points uh, divided by the total number of points in the neighborhood okay that's the likelihood that we are computing given the details of the point okay so the prior probabilities are computed without any knowledge about the point and the likelihood is computed after knowing what the data point is okay which is exactly a uh, computer here likelihood of the point is green is this and likelihood of uh, that point being red is this okay so here actually in this denominator it took all the green cases and all the red cases not just the neighborhood but uh, idea is the same okay <coughs> now uh if i want to compute the overall probability that something is green and overall probability that something is red but now we have two notions right one intuition is telling us something about uh distribution of green and red points without any knowledge of the individual data point which is a prior probability and there is another intuition that came into picture which is in the form of likelihood which is capturing the uh, separate <coughs> or distinct features of the given data point now we have to combine these two types of intuitions in order to come up with our final probability of uh, the new data point being green and the new data point being red okay and one simplest way is to simply multiply these two probabilities okay and which is what you get as a posterior probability okay posterior probability that x is green is equal to the prior probability that x is green okay and likelihood that x is uh, green first thing we computed already as a um, oops 40 by 60 okay which is our 4 by 6 and the likelihood that it is green is we computed here 1 over 40 and we multiply them it's 1 over 60 and similarly the posterior probability that x is red is essentially the multiplication of the prior probability that x is red and the likelihood that x is red given the data point okay and that's this which is 1 1 over 20 now you look at these two probabilities obviously this is uh, greater and therefore you classify that point to be red okay so now if you think about it you are taking this classification problem and modeling it as probabilities and specifically by computing the prior probability which is the initial belief that you have in terms of class distribution without any knowledge about the data point and then there's a notion of likelihood which is the knowledge that you are gaining specific to that data point okay and then you are mixing these two information and coming up with the posterior probability which is what you are uh, finally computing and making your decision based on that okay that's the idea of uh, um, uh, naive base classifier so let's look at the mathematical formulation okay now um, before we look at the formulation of the classification problem actually let's go to the classification problem and come back to base rule now <clears throat> so uh, before i start if you don't follow completely about the math it's absolutely fine as long as you understood the concept of prior probability posterior probability and how we came up with the 
final result using those two uh, concepts. Okay. Now, uh, let's say we have a class label. So let's say we have the label attribute and it has k distinct values. Okay. In the examples that we have seen so far, we have only two classes. Yes, no, spam, no spam, uh, fraudulent, normal, and so on. Right. So that means k is equal to two. But in a general case, k may be uh, more than two as well. Okay. Uh, so let's say my label has k values, which are c1 to ck. Okay. That means given a new uh, test record, I want to predict one of these values for that particular record, which is a class label that we are predicting. Okay. So, so our classification problem in terms of probability is essentially formulated as this. Given the values of all the features of a given attribute, a given record, we want to predict what is the probability that my class label is C1 and what is the probability that label is C2 and so on. Okay. In other words, we want to predict or we want to compute probability of my class is equal to C i. I can be 1, 2, 3 until k. Okay. What is the probability that, uh, what is the probability of C i given the specific test record? And specific test record has specific values for individual attributes. And those attributes are these F1, F2, Fn are the features. Okay. Given the specific values for individual features, which are V1 to Vn, given these values, what is the probability that uh, my class is Ci? Okay. That's why it's a conditional probability. Given this, what is the probability of this? Okay. So you are essentially, it's pretty straightforward, right? Given a test record, you want to predict what the class label is. And the way I'm going to do that is I compute the probability for every possible class label and I choose the one with the highest probability, right? That means let's say given an email, I have, I want to compute what is the probability that it is a spam. What is the probability that it is a non-spam? And I compute the probability and accordingly I make the classification. Okay. That's straightforward. But in terms of probability, it's called a, um, it's like posterior probability, right? Because you are giving the value and then computing the probability of the class. Okay. That's why this is a posterior probability. Now we compute this posterior probability using Bayes rule. Okay. Okay. So we understood what, uh, why posterior probability is the actual classification problem, right? Now we want to compute this left hand side for every class. And the way to compute is something called Bayes rule. And let's look at what Bayes rule is. Okay. So let's look at this equation. Probability that A given B can be written as something like this. Okay. Uh, let's take a example. Um, probability that A given B. Okay. Let's say uh, A is raining. Okay. Probability that it rains given uh, B is cloudy. Okay. So you want to compute what is the probability that it rains given that the day is going to be cloudy. Okay. So that means tomorrow I'll tell you that, okay, tomorrow it is going to be cloudy. Can you tell me what is the probability that it will rain? Okay. That's exactly the problem of computing probability of rain given cloudy condition. Okay. That's what we want to compute. And how can we compute? How will you compute? Let's say you have the record of all uh, last one year data, which has uh, two values, whether it rained or not, and whether it's cloudy or not. Let's say I give you that data. Okay. And 
I asked you this question. Tomorrow it is going to be cloudy. Can you tell me whether it will or, or what is the probability that it will rain? Okay. And how would I compute that? Essentially, I look at all the places, uh, I mean, all the days in which it is cloudy. Okay. Let's say out of 365, 200 are cloudy days. Let's say I'm in uh, Seattle and every, every day it is uh, cloudy. And uh, out of all these 200 days, I will see how many of them are actually raining, right? Maybe 100 of them will rain. Then I'll compute my probability to be 100 divided by 200, right? Pretty straightforward. Everybody with me so far? Yes. So, in terms of mathematical formulation, what, what did I do? I looked at all, if you look at the denominator, I looked at all the days in which it is windy, uh, sorry, cloudy, okay? And in the numerator, I took all the days in which it is raining, right? That means raining and cloudy, right? Because we looked at the rainy days out of those 200. That means I am looking at rainy and cloudy. Okay, that's exactly that intuition that is captured here. So probability of rain given cloudy is equal to probability of rain and cloudy divided by probability of cloudy. Okay, that's exactly what Bayes rule is. It's very simple. Uh, it just captures the intuition that we have already but in a nice mathematical manner. But this is done back in 1700. So you should give him some credibility here. Okay. Actually, uh, just interesting anecdotal story here is that uh, Bayes actually came up with this equation uh, trying to prove whether God exists or not. Uh, for whatever reason, I don't know what A and B in his, in his case, but uh, he was trying to prove or disprove that God exists. And uh, he came up with this Bayes rule in the context of that problem. So it's, it's interesting to know that's how. Uh, so, okay, this is Bayes rule. Now, if I just turn around A and B and say P of B given A, which is again very simple, P of A and B, divided by P of A, okay? So these are uh, the same uh, intuition, but uh, the condition is different. So here you are telling, uh, given that tomorrow will rain, what is the probability that it will be cloudy? That's this question. And this question is tomorrow it is going to be cloudy. What is the probability that it is raining, okay? Uh, Sai Siva, I have uh, no idea what the conclusion was uh, about uh, his observation of God, but uh, that was the problem he was looking at. Now, if I rearrange these equations, I can say probability of A and B is equal to just basically multiply these two, right? That's this. And if I rearrange further, I can say probability of A given B is equal to this one, right? I'm simply replacing P of A and B with uh, this part of the equation, okay? That's the final Bayes rule. Now, what Bayes rule says is, if I want to compute P of A given B, that means P of rain given cloudy, I will compute this way, okay? I put in all the equations and I compute uh, my, uh, the same. And this is exactly called posterior probability. Or actually, if you go here, I simply applied that equation, uh, this equation here, okay? My A is essentially C equal to CI, and B is equal to the actual record, okay? And here, P of A, which is probability of C equal to CI, right? That's my A. And B, uh, this part is probability that B given A, okay? So that means probability that the record given class. And then divided by um, 
probability of B, which is probability of uh, the record. Okay. Now, if you look at individual components of this equation, probability of C equal to CI. What does that mean? It does not have any indication of about this data point. It simply says, what is the probability that class is equal to C1? What is the probability that class equal to C2? Right? This is exactly our notion of prior probability. Right? What is the probability that it is green? What is the probability that it is red? Without knowing anything about the data point. And that's our prior probability. And we know already how to compute that. Right? Simply count uh, the number of instances in your training data with class 1, number of instances in your training data with class 2 and so on. Right? Now, if you look at this component, what does it say? It essentially says, given, so I tell you that it's class equal to C1. Now, what is the probability that I'll observe this data in class equal to C1? Right? That's exactly what this means. Probability that I observe these values for the individual features given that the class is equal to C1. And how would I get that? It's essentially, you look at all your data and get all the records with class equal to CI and then you observe what is the probability that individual values are this, right? It's like saying, I look at all my windy days, okay? And then I look at which one are uh, raining in those uh, windy days, okay? This is the likelihood. That's exactly what we computed in that uh, circle, right? So now you can see that posterior probability is modeled using prior probability and the likelihood simply by using the base rule and the denominator which is a probability that this point occurs which is kind of common for all your c equal to c1 c equal to c2 c equal to c3 if you write all the equations the denominator is common right so you don't really care about it you just compute the numerator and then you can compare all the values uh, based on the numerator so typically you don't compute this one Okay, yeah. everybody follows so far? So, the likelihood here, how can we compute this likelihood? Okay, what is likelihood? Given that class is equal to CI, we want to compute what is the probability that I observe this data. Okay, and how can I compute the probability that I observe this data? I have, basically I have to look at all my data in which uh, C is equal to CI and then I want, I have to compute something like a joint probability that uh, value is V1, value is V2 and value is Vn and so on. Okay, that's like a joint probability. And we make a simplistic assumption and we transform this equation into something like this. Okay, we kind of divided that uh, entire probability into individual probabilities. So here we are saying given C equal to CI, what is the probability that my first feature value is V1 times given my C equal to CI, what is the probability that second value is V2? Okay, so this is slightly different from here. Here what I am saying is given C equal to CI, what is the probability that my first value is V1 and second value is V2 and third value is V3 and so on. Whereas here, I am saying I don't care about all the values. I just care about first value being V1. What is the probability? And here, probability that second value is V2. I don't care about all the others. And here, I am saying the nth value is Vn and I don't care about all the others. Okay? So, we make a simplistic assumption that this is equal to this and we do that by, because it's very easy to compute this from your data, right? I just need to take all the data points in which C is equal to CI and then count how many times V1 occurs and then count how many times V2 occurs and so on, okay? And this is called conditional independence. Uh, given the condition is equal to C equal to CI, 
we are assuming all of these values are independent of each other and that's why we multiply so you don't need to understand conditional independence but we make the simplistic assumptions and and that's why it's called naive model and that's why it's called naive base classifier okay and as you can see every entry in the numerator can be computed simply by counting okay so let's go to uh, another example which is again a toy example it's not any real world example but uh, help you understand and we can go over quickly since we already understood what this is so here the problem is you have a uh, thousand pieces of fruits or thousand fruits and uh, uh, they belong from the categories of banana orange and some other fruit okay and uh, uh, the three characteristics that you want that you record for each fruit are its length its taste and its color okay so whether it's long or not long whether it's sweet or not sweet whether it's yellow or not yellow okay and uh, you have bunch of data that you observe from these thousand pieces and you construct a table like this okay from so here i have three classes right banana orange and other fruit so my k is equal to 3 in my mathematical formulation okay so c1 c2 c3 and for each of the class we compute how many of them are there and uh, you can count, do this counting and construct the table okay now first thing we want to do is prior probabilities right how can i co compute prior probability simply count how many bananas are there how many yellows are uh, oranges are there and how many other fruits are there right which are essentially given by um here 500 divided by 1000 300 divided by 1000 200 divided by 1000 those are my prior probabilities that uh, something is banana orange and other fruit okay which is exactly this okay and uh, let's compute the likelihood and what is the likelihood in our case um let's look at the equation again okay this part is likelihood right and what is this given that it is a banana what is the uh, probability that my first feature is equal to v1 and the first feature is the length right long or not long so we want to compute what is the probability that the fruit is long given that it is banana what is the probability that fruit is orange uh, sorry what is the probability that fruit is long given it is an orange and the long given other fruit okay so these are the three values that you compute for v1 and similarly you will compute probability that not long given banana probability that not long given um uh, given orange and given other fruit and so on okay so you compute the probabilities at uh, individual feature values given the class label okay that's what you uh, compute here list of all possible uh, likelihood functions okay now if we are given a data point which tells you that okay it is long it is sweet and it is yellow okay now you want to predict the class label for that particular fruit okay in terms of probability you want to compute probability that it is banana given probability that it is banana given f1 is equal to long f2 is equal to sweet f3 is equal to yellow okay and similarly probability that c is equal to orange or c2 given f1 is equal to long f2 equal to sweet and f3 equal to yellow and so on okay and by applying that base rule we exactly compute this part probability that banana f1 equal to long f2 equal to sweet and f3 equal to yellow as this right this is a prior probability that it is a banana and 
probability that long given banana probability that sweet given banana probability that yellow given banana okay we don't need to compute uh, probability of evidence uh, because it's common for all the classes so we compute this numerator it comes to that it comes to this 0.252 okay and similarly you can compute probability of orange given f1 equal to long f2 equal to sweet f3 equal to yellow and similarly other fruit and you get 0 and 0 0.01875 okay and you can simply see that this one is much larger than all the other two and therefore you declare this uh, particular guy to be uh, your banana okay that's uh, as simple as that okay so let's look at our r okay so let's go to r so for doing um naive base there's a package called e1071 okay don't ask me why that name i don't know why the authors gave that name maybe there's a good reason um, it's it's used in many places i cannot give one specific example where naive base is used but it's pretty commonly used wherever the classification problem is there like a decision tree or something you can also apply naive base okay so if you're convinced about the use of random uh, decision tree then in the same example you can put uh, um, uh, naive base now in this uh, function uh, package e1071 i load it I, it's already installed so i simply load it and uh, there is a function called naive base okay and uh, it looks pretty similar to what we have seen before you give a formula you give a data and it builds a naive base model okay so nb is equal to uh, naive base of my formula is again similar to before class variable is a function of all the other attributes and my data is equal to d or a training set if I split it into training and testing and that's it I have my uh, naive base classifier and I can look at the structure of naive base classifier as well and it tells you what are the prior probabilities what are the uh, list of tables that it use and so on um, and the final labels which are yes and no okay and yeah these are basically individual um histograms within each of the attribute uh, but you don't really all need all this you simply call that use that model in calling predict right you can call predict and then your naive base model and your test set since we haven't this divided into train and test i am using same d as my test set and then uh this we have seen already class is equal to or type is equal to class okay so i have bunch of uh, predictions using this naive base model does this work with both numeric and factor variables well factor variables are already there they are categorical attributes but will this work with the numeric attributes yes it can work with numerical attribute but i need to discretize my data so i need to discretize my data in order to make it categorical attribute just like we did it for decision trees right so you do the same thing here also and you compute it okay so last time we talked about these two things right oh this is too long yeah so if i say class is e type is equal to class it is going to tell me whether it's a yes or a no or rather class one or class two 
whether it's a patient has a risk of diabetes or not, right? And there's something called PROB or RA, depending on the algorithm. If you do that, then it will give you the probability. Instead of uh, simply predicting yes or no, it will tell you the probability, right? So what did we say in our classification model also? We compute this probability for every class, right? Uh, or rather, if you go here, we compute the probability that it is banana, probability that it is orange, probability that it is other fruit, okay? And then we choose the maximum among that. So in this diabetes case, we had two classes. So we, prob we compute probability that it is no, probability that it is yes. And uh, we simply choose the maximum value and that to be yes here. And similarly for the second record, uh, we do the same thing. Okay. And this one is more than this one. And therefore you chose it to be no and so on. Okay. Now, okay. Uh, and depending on the algorithm, you, uh, other way to look at this uh, probability to yes, no is essentially by putting a threshold. Okay. Let's say I say that, okay, if the probability is greater than 0.5, I say class one. If the probability is less than 0.5, I say class two. So that's another way of taking probabilities and converting them into individual decisions. Okay. Whereas in naive base, we simply take the maximum and uh, convert them into yes and no. And that's our classification. Okay. So let's go to ROC curve. Okay. So this is a confusion matrix that we have seen already. On one side, you have the predicted values or the test outcome. And on the other side, you have the real value, which is a gold standard. Okay. From the testing data. And we already saw what is a true positive, what is a true negative and so on. And using these values, you can also compute these different statistics, accuracy, precision, uh, specificity, sensitivity, and so on. Okay. This we have already seen. Now, uh, ROC cover tells you essentially what, where does your um, classifier stand when compared to a random classifier. Okay. And the way you typically draw this curve is by computing two things. One is false positive rate, FPR, and the other one is true positive rate. Okay. And the true positive rate we have seen uh, already in the last class, it's also called recall, which is the number of true positives given by, uh, I mean, divided by total positives. Okay. This is just the equation that we computed last year, last week, right? That's a true positive. And that's on the Y axis. And on the X axis, you have false positive rate. Okay. It simply says how many false positives are there out of all the negative uh, records. Okay. So these numbers, you can simply compute from this table and you can get a value for false positive rate and a for value for true positive rate. And that should give you a point in this entire ROC space. Okay. So here ROC space, you have uh, values from zero to one for false positive rate and you have values zero to one for true positive rate. Okay. Given this entire space, where would you like your classifier to be? What is the best point that we want to achieve? Okay. Can anybody uh, kind of think about that? I have false positive rate here. I have true positive rate here. And what is the best point that I, that I have to aim for this point, as it already says here, perfect classification. That means we want zero false positives. That means we don't want to make any misprediction. At the same time, we want to make full recall, recall of one. 
right? That means we want to predict all the positive examples that are there in that set, test set. And that's my perfect classification. Okay? So this is the best point a classifier can achieve. Now, but for a given uh, classifier, your uh, false positive rate and negative uh, true positive rate might fall anywhere here, right? A classifier can be here at point C, at A, at B, or at C. Okay? Now, out of all this, how do you choose which one is the best? Okay? The way to uh, figure that out is by simply looking at how does the random guess works. Okay? I won't do any computation. I simply tell you randomly whether it's class 1 or class 2. Okay? And even with that simple classifier, I can get 50% accuracy, assuming the class labels are kind of uh, equally likely. Okay? And that random guess is uh, shown as this red color, red line. Okay? If I'm doing below that line, that means I have a worse true positive rate and the worse false positive rate than this random guess, then obviously it's a hopeless classifier, right? So, which is this? So, C is hopeless here because it's getting more false positive rate and a more uh, true positive rate than a simple random guess. Okay, or, or rather less true positive rate. So anywhere above this diagonal will be a good um, a good point to aim for. Okay, now out of A and C, I will choose C better than A depending on uh, whether true positive and uh, misclassification error and so on. Okay, so this is the ROC space. Now, there's something called as ROC curve and that looks like this, okay? Which is essentially, this is again the random, exact same x-axis, y-axis and I have a random point. Now for every classification model, I compute this entire uh, curve, okay? ROC curve. And for model A, I compute that, model B, I compute that. And the way I compute that, so we have seen already in the previous slide that, so I run decision tree algorithm, right? Yesterday we saw uh, diabetes data set. We ran a decision tree algorithm and we got a confusion matrix and we computed true positives, false positives, false negatives, true negatives, and so on. And using those values, I can compute my true positive rate and I can compute my false positive rate. Okay, that gives me a single point in this entire ROC space, right? It gives me a single point because it's a single classifier. Now imagine the naive Bayes classifier with the probabilities that were given. Okay, now with the naive Bayes classifier or any other classifier like logistic regression, I get a probability that it belongs to class 1 and the probability that it belongs to class 2, right? Now, there is a, a mechanism in which I can convert these probabilities into yes and no decisions, right? Ultimately, I want to give the user yes or no decisions as opposed to probability, right? So, in naive base, what we did is, if probability that class 1 is greater than probability that it class 2, then I choose class 1. So I simply choose the maximum. But in other cases, you just have a probability that it's a, a probability that it belongs to class 1. Okay? Now, you can kind of make it into a binary problem, which is yes and no, simply by putting a threshold. Okay? That means... Whenever the probability or whenever my probability is greater than 80%, I'll say it's class 1. Otherwise, I'll say class 2. Okay? And with that threshold of 80%, I get some classification. I get some predictions. And with those predictions, I get true positives, false positives and all that. And I get a, a data point in my ROC space. Okay? So, for every... Um, 
threshold value. Now, instead of 80%, if I say 70%, okay, if I say anything greater than 70% is positive, anything less than 70% is negative, okay. That gives me different set of predictions and therefore different set of true positives, false positives and all the contingency table, okay, or the confusion matrix. And then from that I get a different uh, values for TPR and FPR and therefore a different point in my ROC space, okay. So by changing the threshold that you are using in order to go from probabilities to yes or no decisions, we are able to get different points in the ROC space, okay. If I simply plot all those points, I get a ROC curve which looks like this, okay. And uh, the, uh, the more area under the curve, under that ROC curve, the better it is. So when will I have highest area? When the curve is like this, right. So that means I am covering the entire area. That means I am kind of moving towards this uh, left end point, which we already thought to be a best classification model, okay. So that is the some high level description of the ROC curve, okay. Even if you do not understand, uh, just uh, remember that there is something called ROC curve which will be used to evaluate how good the model is uh, and whenever there is a need you can always look it up and uh, read more about it, okay. That is uh, and, and if you want more details look at this particular paper, it is an excellent introduction to ROC analysis, okay. How to measure the efficiency? of an algorithm recall and accuracy. So uh, let us go to this one actually. So recall is not equal to accuracy, recall is something different from accuracy, okay. Recall is basically uh, this one the true positives divided by the true positives plus false negatives, okay. That means there are let us say 100 positive values in your data set, okay. This is the ground truth that 100 positives are there. So my denominator will be 100 and then the numerator will be how many of them I actually uh, computed to be positive and that is the recall and accuracy is basically total number of correct predictions which includes positives as well as negatives. So it is essentially true positives plus true negatives divided by all the values that is your accuracy. Whereas a uh, uh, recall simply focuses on the positives not on the negatives, okay. And whereas a precision is essentially comparing with the how many positives that you retrieved, okay. So let us say I score 70 of my records to be positive and only 50 are correctly considered as positives. So 50 is my true positives and 20 is uh, false positives. That means even though they are not positive, I am mistakenly telling them as positive, okay. So my pre precision is uh, the percentage or the ratio of uh, records that I declared to be correct. So it is uh, 50 divided by 70, that is precision, okay. So the key difference between precision and the recall is a denominator. In one case you are looking at the total number of positives that you predicted and in the other case, in the case of recall you are looking at the total number of positives in the ground truth, okay. So that is the key difference and and if you uh, just sit and think about it, uh, it should be clear what the difference is actually. But the key is to identify the difference which is a uh, denominator. 
So, yes, uh, the question is, uh, is there a difference between lift curve and ROC curve? They are kind of similar, but they are different, okay? And lift curves are essentially used uh, mostly in the context of uh, um, uh, like a classic example for lift curve that people give is for campaign advertising, right? Uh, let's say I have a product and uh, I want to send uh, a postal advertisement to, uh, to my customers. Okay, let's say I have 10,000 customers and the thing I can do is I can send them a mail to each of my 10,000 customers and uh, only a fraction of people will respond to my advertisement, right? Only let's say 1% uh, uh, of people or 10% of the people will respond to your advertisement, which is uh, 100 people, 100 or 1,000 people uh, in 10,000, right? But... Uh, you need enough budget to send mails to all these 10,000 people, right? You need to print and do whatever, right? You need to send uh, by post. So, typically, you don't want to send to all the 10,000 people for budgetary constraints or for any other purpose, right? Now, let's say your budget allows you to send only 500, uh, 5,000 uh, mails instead of 10,000. Okay, now how would you choose which 5000 to use? Okay, how do I select my 5000 customers out of these 10,000 customers uh, to whom I send this particular uh, uh, campaign message? Okay, and one simple way is to do, uh, do a random selection. Okay, or I can do some uh, some other data mining method or a, a more intelligent method, right? Let's say if the campaign is about uh, some uh, product related to young people, then I choose based on their age or based on their demographics, based on their gender and so on, right? So I can come up with some extra, uh, put some extra logic in order to figure out who those 500 people to whom I send that particular campaign campaign message okay so the lift curve is essentially captures how how much improvement your specialized method is going to give compared to a random selection of 5000 people okay that's the thing that roc curve cap i mean the lift curve captures compared to a, a random selection of people How much does uh, gain? Okay, so in a way, it's similar to ROC because there are in ROC you are comparing with the classification that relies on uh, uh, random guess, and here you are you are relying uh, you are comparing based on the values that are given by random campaigning process. So it's kind of similar. But at the same time, both are different and they are used in a different context typically. So, so just to conclude, so we essentially looked at uh, different classification models, decision trees, random forests, and naive base classifiers. And uh, we looked at multiple methods in which we can uh, kind of gauge the performance of these classification models, right? using true positives, false positives, precision, accuracy, recall, F measure, and so on. And then we learned about cross-validation as a technique to, uh, again, evaluate the quality of a model with a much more robustness, okay, by changing the training and testing sets. And uh, we just now looked at ROC uh, curves in order to kind of compare uh, different things. So that should give a complete kind of a closure on uh, our classification models. And in the next class, we will see um, how to, so whatever we did so far using R are kind of limited by a single machine, right? And in the next class, we will see how can we scale up uh, R using extra packages like uh, Hadoop related packages, okay?
So we'll see how R and Hadoop can coexist together uh, using these extra scalable packages. Okay, that would be the topic of our next class.